Hey, Tolerators. It's me, Natalie, with your before show updates on all things Team Tolerator. So we are sitting on the January, February, March side of life. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like the misogyny meltdown over on Patreon is well underway. That is a new series and show that I am producing for Patreon members only because there is a lot of scripting and a lot of vulnerability going on. I've already sang a song. I've already produced a skit. I'm already writing comedy. So, so go take a chance on the misogyny meltdown and the way that to all the men I've tolerated before is expanding and evolving with the link in the show notes. For January, we celebrated the Misogynist of the Year award ceremony. For February, we are focusing on the concept of love and self-love being part of the resistance. And in March, why, yes, we're still going to do seasonal things with celebrating International Women's Month. And all of that will be wrapped up into our new variety show, Misogyny Meltdown. I cannot wait for you to check it out. Tolerators, this is to all the men I've tolerated before with Family Katona, your weekly look at everyday misogyny. Today, one of our favorite guests is back. It's Ellen Moore from The Slut Show with Ellen Moore. And she's going to be sharing her experiences with hormonal birth control and eventually taking yourself off of hormonal birth control. Ellen, thank you for always picking such personal and deep subjects to come on you're this show. so welcome thank you so much for having me again i'm so excited to be here to be back and to discuss something that is a topic that over the last year has become so important to me and like discussing this topic with the women around me the people who have uteruses and like just hormones and everything it is so important and i knew i didn't know shit man i really didn't know shit and then i did research and i was like fuck i really didn't know shit it is amazing how much as a woman I have been trained to put trust into quote unquote experts while Mm. I also (laughs) while I also logically know that none of those experts are actually going to take the extra five minutes to explain what something could do to my body. It is wild to me. And also like um, there is a thing called informed consent and it is not practiced uh, in, in like healthcare when it comes to birth control uh, very often it's it's not the standard it's not the norm and for me personally there was no informed consent whatsoever i was just put on hormones and they were like it's gonna help you with this or that and and yeah it it was a joke it was a fucking joke how how has been hormone like your 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 own hormonal like process how has that been for you so my hormones have been of course a roller coaster and a journey and the reason i eventually went on birth control is because my menstrual cycle would cause me to have such bad migraines and light sensitivity and pain that for two to three out of the four to five days that I would be on my period, I couldn't, I couldn't work. I couldn't go to class. I couldn't, I could literally just like curl up in the fetal position in the dark and cry myself to sleep. Wild. And then the pill really did even that out. Now that I am in my mid 30s, I am starting to experience new hormone side effects like premenstrual fatigue. I can't remember the last time that I went a whole week with my boobs feeling the same. Like, I'm like, they're either always sore or heavy or in the way or. <laughs> and Boy in the way and Girl, I, I wish i could relate i'm flat like a <laughs> surfboard <laughs> well maybe when you're 30 they'll just be heavy and flat because i i truly cannot express this feeling like i i became so aware of my own breasts 
within the past two years. Now, oh, and I'm also having violent period paranoia and mood sw- swings. Like, right. So you're day- not on hor- on any synthetic hormones right now, right? I am on synthetic hormones still because I'm still really scared of the pain. It's like I can regulate my own mood, but I'm such a little baby when it comes to pain. Like I won't be able to focus. Right, right. So yeah, God, so relatable. So for me, I, I, um, I was on. I didn't realize this, but I was on four different birth control pills before I was. I, I chose myself uh, to get an IUD. And so for me, I, I began having migraines um, and like tension headaches when I was around 14, although I vividly remember having like headaches and everything around eight, eight that around like age eight. It started really, really, really at a very young age for me. That also certainly had to do with the, the abusive situation I was in. Um, but that was a very like consistent and repetitive pattern for me. And um Basically, doctors just told me like, hey, here's the pill because it'll work against migraines. Um, and now I am 24, turning 25 and over the summer um, of 2024. And I figured out that um, research has consistently and repetitively shown that the birth control pill does not actually help against migraines at all. Um, sometimes it even worsens them. And that was the case for me. Um, my migraines worsened on pill one. And so they were like, okay, let's switch to two. And they worsened and they were like, okay, let's switch to three. And then they seemed to get better. Um, but that looking back now was most probably the end of a cluster because I turn out to have cluster headaches and not migraines, which I was misdiagnosed for because I'm, I'm a woman and most people with cluster headaches are men. And because it's only been not even 30 years since women have been in like research, uh, clinical trials and whatever. Uh, so, of course, being a woman makes you that much less likely to be diagnosed. And so I, I literally was on four different pills until I just said, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to be on the pill. Uh, let me just not use a pill. Then I actually became infertile. My bleeding wouldn't come back for months and then so that was in between like pill pill three and four and then i was put on another pill they were like okay well then if you don't bleed let's just put a pill in that'll help which makes no sense at all and then i stopped with that one and again i became infertile and i wouldn't bleed for like months and months and months but i just would not have a period then i lost so much weight uh, due to modeling that i like became infertile due to my anorexia so my body has been through so much and when I wanted to get my IUD it was predominantly because I was just sleeping around and I just wanted to have a little backup in case a condom failed I didn't want to use like the morning after pill every now and then I definitely didn't want to opt for an abortion I was on that for three three and a half years maybe even four and then I um, got it removed over the summer and it's been a journey ever since fuck (laughs) were you on the because there are two types of IUDs, right? There's the hormonal one and then there's the copper one. The one that, like, I believe uses witchcraft to keep you from getting pregnant. Because they're like, it's copper. And I'm like, okay. Yeah, exactly. So what, what a copper IUD does, I was on the hormonal one, but a copper IUD uh, works because it literally, that's a really fun fact to me, the, the copper in the IUD that like, kind of like releases inside of your uterus causes an inflammatory reaction inside of your uterus, which makes your per- periods heavier because your uterus is literally inflamed and it's not good at all. Um, and it works because um, the copper also, it beheads the... <laughs> sperm cells literally it just it kills them like that everything about that sounds terrible except for maybe the beheading of sperm i'm kind of into that but like <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> yeah for, for sure no it's it's wild so my sister and i have never been into the iud because we hate the shape of it for some reason <laughs> it like looks like a scorpion or something to me and i'm like no <laughs> like, nah, 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 nah. But to hear that the copper was, it's like, well, it just like gives your uterus lead poisoning and then you can't get pregnant. I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it literally does that. And so hormonal IODs, they there there are several theories on on why they are effective. 
scientists don't really have like a unanimous uh, agreement on that. They haven't reached like a consensus or anything. There are several reasons why an IUD can work. It can be because the IUD is literally just in the way. Um, and so a an egg cannot be fertilized. It can also be because the hormones uh, in like a hormonal IUD, they, they stop you from ovulating. But you can still have a cycle on with an IUD because when you take an IUD, it's it's the least amount of hormones that you can get because it's, it's placed inside your uterus. And so when it's in your uterus, it's like where it's supposed to be. And if you take a pill, you have to take higher dosages of hormones because it has to travel all the way to your uterus and whatever. Same goes for like an implant in your arm and so they don't really know what 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 it, what it is but it works it works and it works really well but for me like getting that place was a fucking nightmare i was in so much pain and they don't even they don't give you painkillers at all they're like just pop a little bit of ibuprofen before and that's it yeah the way that i i have always been explained the IUD being inserted into you it's like birth and reverse and like everything down there is meant to contract and keep things out of it <laughs> and they're just like no nope. and I'm like no that's not how the muscles work <laughs> and they're using this medieval torture device to insert it as well which is wild to me and it hasn't really changed, like, the shape of that thing. I don't know what it's called in English, to be honest, but, like, the, the, the metal thing they put to open your cervix so that you can... A speculum. Look, I knew it. <laughs> so the speculum hasn't really changed that much over the years, and it was, I, I, I don't know the exact details, but it was, like, developed by this, this male scientist, of course, and, um, yeah, it hasn't really, really changed much, and although it's effective, it's also painful for a lot of people with uteruses. For me, that was not the worst part. Like the measuring of the uterus. Oh, they Ooh. measure your uterus. That is like a wild experience. Luckily, it's a short lasting experience. But for me, like a, an IUD needs to like implant itself. That's that's how they write it off. They're like, that's just implantation training. And so for the first six weeks after getting my IUD placed, I really don't want to scare people listening. But for me, I couldn't do jack shit. I was literally laying on the floor crying and couldn't even get up to go, go to the restroom. It was a nightmare. So, like, getting your pap smear, when TikTok started telling me, like, you can actually advocate for yourself and insist on some sort of local anesthetic or whatever for your pap smear, and I was like, oh, I never actually think about questioning anything that my doctor is doing. So if they're just like, no, we're going to scrape your cervix and in two hours you'll be fine. I'm just like, yeah, I guess, like, this is just how it goes. But I have, in my history of getting pap smears, I have had a really excellent doctor where I went to a medical group and their whole thing is like midwifery and reproductive care and breast care at this place. And she, the reason I know what a speculum is, is because to combat patient anxiety she literally narrates what she's doing the entire time and also goes quickly <laughs> so it's like a no fuss no must situation and then when I lost my health insurance due to my COVID unemployment I had to go to a different place due to my like state given health insurance and this woman truly Truly the only reason I went, because I was like, why would I go to the doctor? I don't have good health insurance and I'm unemployed. If they tell me that something is wrong with me, I can't do anything about it. The only reason I went is because I was putting on lotion and I felt something in my breast. And I was like, well, now I guess I got to schedule a pap smear and a breast exam and all of it. Number one, that lady yelled at me for doing, well, she's like, why would you be doing a breast exam this close to your period? And I was like, I wasn't. I was just putting lotion on my body and felt something and thought I was being an adult. And then she was so, like, rough with my breast and my cervix and, like, so irritated by the mere thought of me that I was sore for, like, a week. And I've never experienced that. It's like an assault. Yeah, truly. Truly. Oh my God, I hate that you have to experience that. I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Yeah, 
And people were like, you should have written a review. And I was like, I have ADHD. If I could only remember that lady's name. (laughs) (laughs) Fuck. But I, so with the medical situation that my mom's going through, her husband went to the doctor with her and like pre came with questions, like a list of questions. And I was like, that must have been so nice because my friend Stephanie and I joke that every time we go to the doctor, and they're like, do you have any questions? We always just want to go, what did the person before us ask you? Like, did they have good ones? <laughs> because we don't know. <laughs> like, right. We're so uneducated about our hormonal cycles and our bodies that I'm like, I don't know what to ask you. What would you like me to ask you? Like, what's a heavy hitter you don't get? Like, <laughs> Right. Would you like to know some fun facts about synthetic hormones? I would love to know some fun facts about synthetic hormones. So stroke is the second highest cause of disability in developed countries and the second most common cause of death globally. There's different types of strokes, ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke. All those details put aside. Migraine doubles your chances at having an ischemic stroke. However, the use of combined oral, uh, oral no, combined hormonal contraceptives makes you almost five times more likely to suffer ischemic stroke. And the use of combined hormonal hormonal contraceptives in women with a history of migraine has been associated with a six-fold increase of ischemic stroke. I wrote an article on uh, on our website, theslutshow.org, uh, about birth control um, as like the, the science part to our episode about birth control and what I learned literally just baffled me and the more I learned and the more I read and the more I researched and the more books I bought and the more documentaries I watched and the more um digging I did the more I realized I wanted to get that IUD out of my uterus as soon as fucking possible um hormonal birth control rises your um like it changes the way you deal with cortisol Uh, cortisol is the most important one of the most important hormones in the human stress response system it causes uh, a delayed cortisol awakening response which makes it hard for women on hormonal birth control to wake up they can feel like sluggish or like just have brain fog it's also been linked the use of hormonal birth control has been linked to anxiety to depression to insomnia to suicide Uh, it is genuinely like a shit show the first time use of antidepressants increases when you're on hormonal hormonal birth control your partner attraction changes the how attractive partners perceive you changes as well your breast cancer risk can increase on some form of hormonal birth control your bone density can deteriorate as a consequence of hormonal birth control yeah, well, the list goes on. It, it even hormonal birth control even depletes um, minerals and vitamins from your body. And of course, that's not for all people, and of course, that's not for every single type of uh, hormonal birth control. But for most, this is the case. If you want to know like the exact details and the exact facts, uh, you can read the article on our on our website. But it's it's wild. It is just wild. And these are things that I was never in my life taught any of these things. Well, and for some of us, like, I was probably 21, 22 when I finally went on the pill, which is still extremely young. Some mothers are pretty, are, like, having those conversations with their daughters, like, earlier and earlier, where it's, like, it's 16. Do you want to talk to the doctor about birth control? 14. Yeah, and no one gives us a lecture. It's such a dichotomy in my head because birth control is such a big part in the agency and the advocacy that we have about whether or not we will be mothers and we will get pregnant and all of it. And it is part of our body autonomy, which is under attack right now. 100%. 100%. But then you also have to remember that the people who developed birth control are also operating under the misogynistic patriarchal system. So they're not doing the research that would actually benefit women 100 percent, and and they they don't have their their priorities straight so to get back on like the depression fact uh, starting the contraceptive pill at ages 15 to 19 makes you anywhere between 80 to 120 percent more likely to get depressed about the they don't have their priorities set straight i very literally mean that because a pharmaceutical company merck paid a total of 100 million to settle about 1850 claims of cases of injury and death in 2014 
as a result of people using their new ring, literally one type of birth control that is, then in 20, 2009, pharmaceutical company Bayer spent 20 million on corrective a- advertising following misleading TV commercials. Are you fucking kidding me? And they have spent years paying off women and those with menstrual cycles who suffered complications as a result of their products, Jazz and Jasmine. Uh, for example, in 2012, they paid $56.9 million to settle about 1,200 claims for heart attacks and strokes. In 2015, they paid about $21.5 million to settle about 7,200 claims for gallbladder injuries. And in 2016, they paid $2.4 $2.04 billion to settle about 10,300 claims for blood clot injuries. If they would spend that money on doing actual research, we would be doing a lot better. Well, and that's always it, too, because that's how capitalism operates, right? It's all mirrors and shadows, and it's all like, well, we'll put money towards the consequences, but not preventing consequences. And... <laughs> You know, I ended my holiday depression this year just very angry. Like, I was so angry, just like every day. Like, and I've talked about this before on an episode where it's like, if you were making fun of Taylor Swift, you were making fun of me, and I was pissed about it. If you were mad at Beyonce for being a country artist, you were mad at me for loving country, and I was pissed about it. It's just becoming increasingly hard to believe that as a woman or a uterus owner or as a queer person or a person of color or as a trans member of my community like anyone who is in a white cis man can like wake up today and be like i'm gonna be safe and happy Mm, exactly exactly it is so fucking enraging and like it blows my mind and honestly before i did all this research i thought it was just like accidental and they didn't do it on purpose yada 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 but these pharmaceutical companies they spend mind-boggling sums of money every fucking day to pay for the silence of their victims while like this these sums of money you you can't just like get them from from thin air you have to like put them aside you have to calculate it into your annual budget in order to cover it if they can calculate that into their annual budget, why can't I can't they do fucking research? It is wild. Well, it mirrors what ended up getting us into the opioid crisis, where it was like instead of actually focusing on what these pain meds were doing to us, they just kept peddling pain meds, and people were getting rich and cars and mansions off of it meanwhile like families were being destroyed by addiction so long as the punishment is financial the crime is legal Uh uh-huh and then it also mirrors like how big tobacco operates where it's like if we throw enough money covering up the fact that cigarettes cause cancer maybe people will forget that cigarettes cause cancer what country, there was a country that started putting like on their cigarette cartons, like, just so you know, this is what your lung is going to look like in five years if you continue. Oh, oh yeah, we have that here in the Netherlands. Yeah, we, we have like dying babies on, on the packages. We have like uh, disgusting lungs. We have like, you, you cannot like, as crazy as you can think of it, that it'll be on the, on the package, which is really good. But people don't care. People just cross it out or they, they smoke it anyways. They They don't care. But then at least it's a like, it's a choice (laughs) but is that not on like cigarette packages in the states no we have like a disclaimer warning but we don't have like graphic images oh wow i i've literally i don't think i've seen like a package without a picture like that in the past 10 years honestly what they should do is that they should start putting the sti slides that they use to like scare high schoolers out of having sex (laughs) on the condom boxes to be like this is what these prevent (laughs) put on a condom but it just what hits me is as women or as uterus owners we have been oppressed and our home hormones have been weaponized against us when it comes to like getting hired for a job in our relationships oh you seem a little nuts today are the hormones Mm -hmm. Mm arranging in court probably 
there's a lot of prejudice that goes around when it comes to women and their hormones. So they're very aware that our hormones have an intense like amount to do with our mental and emotional state. And yet at no point has anyone gone, I wonder if we should look into this and stop pumping them full of other hormones. So men have, so when I say men and women, um, I, I talk about people with penises and people with uteruses. They are interchangeably, they get right, like in this scenario. So men have a 24 hour hormonal cycle. So every 24 hours, their hormones go through more or less the same type of uh, fluctuations. They, some increase, some decrease. I don't know exactly how it goes because I don't give a shit about men's hormonal cycles. I do give a shit, however, about female hormonal cycles. And so we also have a 24 hour cycle. But on top of that, we have our monthly cycle, um, which is incredibly important for the functioning of a woman as we were literally designed to be. So that begins with like you can you can translate it to, to seasons. So when you're bleeding, that's that's the start of your your menstruation. And that's day one of your cycle. And so that you, you call the bleeding part winter after winter when like the the flow stops it becomes spring then that's the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle and then you have the tiny part where you ovulate which is summer and then after summer comes fall and that's the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle which also includes the premenstrual phase of the cycle which can cause pms pmdd symptoms whatever it is for you personally and then you begin winter again as you begin bleeding again and in those uh, different phases of the cycle hormones change consistently so your estrogen increases decreases it does all kinds of things your progesterone increases decreases your luteinizing hormone your follicle stimulating hormone and your okay so it's 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 more or less your follicle stimulating hormone your luteinizing hormone and also testosterone also like has enough is it's also differentiating throughout the cycle um and that is also seen if you were to measure your basal body temperature every single day you get a graph and you see your body temperature increasing and, and decreasing usually on day one of your cycle or the day before that your temperature decreases which winter it's cold then it kind of flows back up back down and when you've ovulated your temperature increases with 0.3 to 0.5 per, uh, degrees celsius and because of like measuring your basal body temperature you can do a thing that's called fertility tracking that is based on the, that temperature and your temperature always increases based on your hormone levels and after i got my iud removed i began doing fertility tracking and it kind of sounds like yada yada, yada it, sure it'll it'll work i don't know it's like the calendar method but it's so different and it's actually based on science. It is based on facts. It is based on what we do know about the female body and about how hormones influence us. And honestly, it was the best choice I have made for my body since I don't fucking know how long, but forever. It's it's done me so good to know where I am on my cycle, what I can expect, and uh, to learn how to live with my monthly cycle instead of just living with my 24-hour cycle because what I can expect of myself in fall is completely different than what I can expect of myself in spring and summer. And then I'm talking about the inner seasons and learning to adapt to those inner seasons and to what my body actually need needs is just mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. I've, I've never experienced such a thing. It's wild. Well, yeah, it truly feels like true body agency now because you you and i have talked about this before too it's like we can do all of the tracking and have all of the self-awareness in the world about our bodies but our bodies also still have to deal with capitalism i have often said i was like i would vote for anyone for president if they said that they believed in menstrual leave right right that's so important menstrual leave it's so 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 important there are days where I literally do feel like I am unable to function and I'm just fighting through it. And I mean, and I, I think I cut this story out or no, I didn't cut it out of an episode, but I chose to not put the clip on TikTok. It's even just like having the right. And again, making working from home makes it so much easier to be a uterus owner. Because you are then like 
if I need to take a 15 minute shower to relieve cramps or because something got gross, I can do that. But I remember the last time I was in an office, my period will do this lovely thing where it gaslights me into believing it's over. And then I sneeze <laughs> and it restarts. <laughs> like, right. So that's exactly what happened. I had gone to McDonald's for my lunch break and I was on the phone and I coughed and I sneezed and I immediately knew I was like, oh, God, wearing nothing, just wearing like regular clothing. I knew I was like, I literally just released the Red Sea into my car. The fact that there was a like carnage on my car, I'll never understand. And it was the first time in my life that and I truly like think that COVID did this to me where I was like, I truly don't give a fuck that this will be inconvenient to my boss and my job. And this doesn't make me a good employee. I am texting him and I'm like, I'm going home to change my clothes and I'm not coming back because I can work from home and it's a 45 minute drive. Like I will waste more of your time going home, showering myself up, dressing myself and then getting back on the road than I would if I just got home, took care of myself and then continued to work from my home. And I just told him, I didn't even ask. I was like, I have a a female outfit emergency <laughs> that is gross. And will literally be gross for the rest of the day. And I'm going home to change my clothes. And truly, part of me was like, is it still discrimination if they reprimand me and or fire me? Like, do I have like justifiable cause here? But part of me also didn't care. Right. And and that's fair. That's so fair. I menstrual leave is so incredibly important. And since I came off my uh, my hormonal birth control, I began taking that very serious. And I really make an effort to take like at least the first three days of my period as menstrual leave, but also like the day before my period starts, because that is as bad for me. I have PMDD and so a premenstrual dysphoric disorder. I think we touched upon it like in, a, in an episode, like a previous episode or something. The fall of my cycle worsens my ADHD. It increases PMDD. I'm in constant pain, actually. Uh, my my tits hurt so bad. Like I Like even if I stroke against them, they, they hurt um that's like the max i can max action i can can get it's like literally just stroking against them and that's all like we got to do it real light and like mentally it's a nightmare and um interesting is that for a very long time they thought that pmdd was actually um a mental disorder and it is not it is a neuroendocrine neuroendocrine um disorder and it's actually because your body doesn't respond to progesterone as a regular um, body would which uh, causes all these symptoms it's it's very interesting to look into uh, quite quite some women do have that this and it's just a very unknown condition again because there wasn't a lot of research put into it as most things that women deal with when i looked into it they likened it to they said everything that you just said and then they likened it to your body actually being allergic to the hormone that's being released into the body and i was like well that does make sense <laughs> so yeah yeah so you're not actually like literally allergic to it but you respond in like generally progesterone calms you emotionally and for people who suffer pmdd it does the exact opposite part of me also feels like if they actually started running medical trials on female hormones and the hormones that it takes to like operate a uterus and all of it they know that they would have to make stipulations for us and accommodations and that's why they won't do it there's actually no money in like doing research on female-based illnesses or female-based medical experiences because they'd have to accommodate us and that means that we couldn't be our good little soldiers in the capitalism war I strongly agree. I highly, I, I so am of the opinion that that is part of the problem, exactly. Because if they know what is bothering us and what's stopping us, then they also need to exactly accommodate society in, in such a way that we are less hurt and less bothered by all these things. And doing so would just cost more money than it would, well, they think it would cost more money than it would provide for them. But I would argue the opposite. And the problem is, is like, to me, that is cut and dry 
discrimination. Like the mere fact that you won't do medical trials on what's going on in my body, that is discrimination. It is. But we've been so gaslit to just feel like women's lives are pain and periods are pain. And if you have a weird period, that's just on you. That's on your family history. The women in my lives, in my lives, in my multiple lives, the women in my life have had horrendous menstrual cycles. And we've like, I have always had a pretty decent reaction i think it's because i'm on like the lowest level of birth control you can ever be on because i never talk to a doctor about like hey i'm getting older or like my body's bigger should we be on a bigger hormone to make sure i'm not getting pregnant or whatever it was literally a pain management device for my cramps and for the mood swings that i would and the and everything so i'm like on the lowest i like i think i'm on what they probably put like middle schoolers on or whatever and i've truly never had adverse side effects now as i get older i do like am very aware that there are changes going on in the hormones in my body the other part of me when i lay down because i had this chest cold the other day i was like i just need 20 minutes to lay down and then i'll be able to focus again on work i like went into a hot flash And I was like, do I have a, do I have a fever? Is this actually the flu? Or like, I will just have, there will be a point in the night. It's around like nine or 10 o'clock at night where if it's winter and the heat is still on, I can't stand it. Like all of a sudden my house is too hot and I'm like, oh my God, I'm too hot. And I have to like eat ice cream to regulate my body temperature or something. And, (laughs) And I'm like, I'm 35. I know nothing about menopause. I don't even know when we're supposed to start menopause. I go, am I in perimenopause? What's going on? And (laughs) who would know? You could be in like early perimenopause, but like I, to be honest, I don't know enough about menopause myself. I'm going to do an episode about it though. So I should learn, learn more about it soon. But did did you actually know that if you're on hormonal birth control, you don't actually have a period, you have a withdrawal bleed? Yes. I did know that your periods are fake on your period, right on your, right on so the pill. yeah exactly so there it's a withdrawal bleed so basically what hormonal birth control does it completely takes over your production of estrogen and progesterone depending on the type you have if, if it's a combined pill it takes over both estrogen and progesterone and you take the pill so your hormones um have like it's it turns into a 24-hour cycle because the monthly cycle of like these fluctuations that you see in estrogen progesterone testosterone um, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone does not happen. It mm-hmm. flattens entirely, and you're actually put in the exact condition that a person post menopause would be in. Oh, okay. That's what it does to your body. I mean, I've always known that, like, I didn't know that it was a withdrawal bleed, but I did know I was like, it's a fake period. And that's actually mm-hmm. why your periods are lighter. And your all body is so shocked with, like, not getting the hormones that you put into it every day that it just begins bleeding. That's a withdrawal bleed. And that's also why when you go off of it, your periods are so long and so awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because also your body, your, your hormone, your hormones are completely dysregulate because of like the whole machine is shut off Mm -hmm. because of hormonal birth control. So when you stop taking it, it takes a while for that machine to restore itself. It's, you know, your, your body is not a machine that you can turn on and off. It takes time and takes effort it takes a lot of energy out of your body so the longer you are on hormonal contraceptives the longer it may also take for those hormones to restore back to normal and for some people it happens immediately and they experience no trouble at all but that is not actually the norm and that is not how it goes for most people and that is something that a lot of um, people actually don't um, what a lot of doctors don't disclose that information whatsoever and i think i think at the end of the day whether you choose to smoke cigarettes or not smoke cigarettes or take birth control or not take birth control that's a personal choice I think it's always the withholding of information where I'm like because then you're because then there's not informed consent because I didn't actually understand you know we were going to talk about love is blind just offline in a little chatty chat (laughs) but you know when 
I don't know. They they were all boring white men and they all had J names. But Johnny, Johnny, and Oh my god. Oh my god. The one who was like, My girlfriends have always been on birth control, so I feel like Right. You so to you're be gonna in. be on him too? Yeah. And I was like, I was so irritated at him. And people kept Are condoms on an option boy? What That's what fuck? I kept I was literally screaming it at my TV. I was like wrap it and tug it out if you're like this upset like <laughs> like or just like come in a condom or like don't even come inside her like it's not her problem get a fucking vasectomy or don't ask a person to be on birth control take your own birth control if you want somebody to be on birth control take it yourself you cannot demand that from a woman who clearly had other medical reasons for not wanting to be on that pill and Again, there is no informed consent, and that's what pisses me off. They're not being informed consent about birth control. Like, birth control in and of itself is a great invention. Although the process of inventing it was miserable, and there's a lot of eugenics even involved in, in the whole process. Um, interesting, fascinating, and miserable. Um, however, the and, and, you know, it set women free in a lot of different ways, and it's it's good in a lot of different ways, but it's also miserable in the sense that there is no informed consent, generally speaking. And that is just, oh my God, I, I don't even have words for it. I only have swear words. I'm so pissed. Well, and then what always gets me is like, well, I'm also an uninformed, not expert doing all of this research on myself. Mm -hmm. Also just like riling up my anxiety. Mm -hmm. And then when you bring your anxiety to like a medical profession, and you're like hey i read on the internet or i heard on a podcast that like maybe birth control is actually bad for me then they're like well are you a doctor we wouldn't be prescribing it to you if it was bad for you <laughs> and it's like they are okay. literally gaslighting you and no i'm not a doctor but i do have eyes and i do have a functioning brain and i do know where to find research and i do know what is factual and what is not and i also know how capitalism works and i know that you are most likely getting paid to prescribe birth control pills so who should i trust myself and my own uh judgment or you being paid by these pharmaceutical companies because i don't think it's you honey well, and we talked in another episode about just the medical system currently and how it's reactive instead of proactive. So it's like, well, if something happens to you because you were on birth control, we'll just take care of it. And it's like, OK, cool. Um, we don't have universal health care, so that's not always an option over here in the States. But it's the whole idea that, like, instead of whatever is happening in my body being a conversation with someone it's just like a checkoff list well did you have this do you have a family history do you have a b and c and when you understand that something has changed in your body i just need the medical field to kind of just like catch up with the fact that we are getting more knowledgeable and there is more information available to us and therefore when i go to the doctor it should be a conversation absolutely you're here it should be a consultation and it shouldn't be like i know that the pharmacist will like ask me like do you have any questions for me and i'm like does it really matter you've already filled this and i've already agreed to take it but i and again I don't always think that it's very fair that that conversation is on me, the patient. I'm saying the self advocacy is wild, and it's it's there. Women have to do so much more self advocacy to get any diagnosis. Really, like for me personally, if it wouldn't have been for my self advocacy, I wouldn't have had an ADHD diagnosis. Yet I have ADHD, and it's raging. If it wouldn't have been for me, I wouldn't have had a PMDD diagnosis, and I actually have PMDD. If it wouldn't have been for me, I wouldn't have had a cluster headache diagnosis, but I do have that. And it, it was all my self-advocacy and my hard work and my hard research and my sleepless nights and me being on literally the wrong meds for over 10 years. It is just insane. Well, and 
it's trial and error, but it's trial and error happening in my body. Like, exactly. I'm not a fucking rat you can experiment on. And what interested me about that plot line on Love is Blind is he was open to having the vasectomy until he himself did research and realized that there were lasting effects of a vasectomy. But he never crossed the bridge into, oh, she also did research and realized that there were lasting effects to being on synthetic hormones. <laughs> he just went, so it turns out that vasectomies aren't that cut and dry. And like, it's actually a medical procedure. And she's like, and she never like, if I were her, I would say, OK, but you are also asking me to do a daily medical procedure when there. Are- yeah, exactly. Where we could be tracking my cycle, where like we could get a calendar, where you could literally wear a condom. Fertility tracking is a thing, man. It's a thing, and people use it, and they do pretty okay at it. And I, I just got so mad because I'm so tired of emotional and mental labor of other people's being put on the nearest woman in the room. This is his anxiety. This is his like nerve point this is him having a lack of education about how to actually prevent pregnancy and he's decided that her changing her belief system on medicine is the easy fix i I don't want to get a vasectomy because i don't want to go like go through a medical procedure so you take a pill every single day because i am scared of a condom not working even though it is eight ninety eight percent effect 89 percent effective I am actually currently using a fertility tracking app. Um, it's not sponsored, although I do have a discount. So if you slide into my DMs, I will share it with you. <laughs> it's Natural Cycles. And uh, that is actually 98% effective with perfect use and 93% effective with regular use. Um, and I have had my man come inside me without a condom on green days for since... Well, for almost a year now, and grow, there is no nothing growing inside of my uterus, and I just use a condom on days when I am fertile, and it's not that many days. It's like maximum half of my cycle, and even that is like an over exaggeration. But because like the only moment you're actually fertile is when your egg releases from the fallopian tubes into the uterus, and the reason you're five days fertile per cycle is because sperm can live up to five days inside of your uterus. So the problem isn't really women; it's it's the millions of sperm always a problem did you ever watch working moms on netflix it's a comedy sitcom i'm unsure if i like i did watch something moms what is it about work so it's about a group of moms who are in the same like mommy and me group and they're and they all work so it's like working moms and it's a comedy and in the last season one of them works as an ad agency as like don draper and they, the account they got was for male birth control for like male contraceptives. And so she put her husband on it and he was like, and all of a sudden he like loved the bachelor and was crying every day and like had tenderness or whatever. And, but he, he immediately went off of it and she, and like the parallels of her going, you've literally watched that happen to me my entire life. And you couldn't do it for like a week. <laughs> like it's just amazing how aware we are of the the sacrifices and the emotional and mental labor that women take on in their homes. And yet, like truly we have yet to come up with solutions, except for I guess divorce. Like every once in a while I'm like, it might just be kicking that man out of your house. <laughs> like Yeah, it may just be. The birth control thing really got me because I was like, he's not listening to her. She has done all of this research. She has beer. It's not like she was like, oh, I've just never been into it. <laughs> like, uh. Also, she's a, she's a fully fledged sexually active woman who's never who never disclosed to you that she had pregnancy scares. You know, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm just I, I can't even Christ on a bike. It's just wild. It's just wild that even when even when I think like, oh yeah, that that's part of it. Like that is feminism, having agency over whether or not I'm pregnant, 
that's part of it. And we should protect that. I also have to remember like, okay, but who's benefiting off of the thing that they have told me is body autonomy and body agency. And it always wraps back to, I mean, it's why feminism became trendy. And all of a sudden we were all buying t-shirts and hats and stickers. At the end of the day, like men will always prioritize the patriarchy and misogyny will always prioritize money over the daughters sisters wives and mothers that are within their homes i'm going to move us into our lasting little ceremony what do you think has been your biggest takeaway going through all of this with taking yourself off hormonal birth control and all of it that it was the best decision I could have made for my body, truly. It's been so empowering quitting hormonal birth control. It's been so empowering telling my doctor to take it out of my uterus and that I would not, did not want to have a discussion about it, that I wanted it removed right then, right there. Uh, it's been so empowering to regain control over my cycle, to learn how my body like responds to hormones, to learn all these things about myself and to um, take care of my body in a way that actually nourishes it and that takes care of it in a way um, accounting for my monthly cycle as well as my 24-hour cycle instead of just taking care of like the 24-hour cycle that is not the only cycle that we have as women. I think my biggest takeaway is unfortunately like it's still on us until the medical field like actually catches up on what it means to support women and be an ally to people who have uteruses and stop you know, being prejudiced against us. The biggest form of advocacy and body agency you can do is advocate for yourself and make make sure that you have informed decisions. Exactly. So that might be Google searching before every listen doctor. Listen to the slut a, show. Listen to the <laughs> slut show. Get a podcast on. Actually pay attention to the news. Um, mm. Watch a documentary. And then like also... It's okay to also still decide, like, what's best for Ellen, wasn't best for me, wasn't best for Natalie. Like, at the end of the day, everybody is different. But no one's going to give you the cheat sheet on how to regulate your hormones. So you have to figure it out, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. And and another, like, uh, um... A documentary that I really recommend is The Business of Birth Control, um, which is so, so good. So if, you, if you're interested in learning more about birth control, uh, besides listening to my podcast and uh, the article that I wrote on this topic, I would also highly recommend watching the documentaries, The Business of Birth Control. Yeah. I mean, information is power. I feel like we've gotten away from information. And I'll tell you why we've gotten away from information is power is because they are purposely, at least over here in this country, making schools so dumbed down that kids forget that critical thinking and knowledge is actually power because schools are a pipeline to capitalism. (laughs) Yes, they are. Yes, they are. The end. The end. But what would you manifest for the future when it comes to all of this? Research on female hormones, research on the actual long-lasting consequences of birth, birth control, uh, improvement of birth control, improvement of male birth control, normalization of vasectomies, and just fuck the patriarchy, man. That's what it manifests. <laughs> fuck the patriarchy. And I also manifest, I really do hope that everyone shops around for a doctor until a doctor actually feels like your partner in your health care. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that I mean it took me a while to find a doctor who listened to me and wasn't just like everyone gets big sad and I'm like okay. I'm, I'm glad you found them yeah and you know you need to cultivate you should be treating doctors like you treat therapists where you're cultivating relationships with them so I hope that that starts to become easier and I hope that everyone gets universal health care <laughs> Yes, so do I. <laughs> because you can't cultivate a relationship if you're held off from the relationship due to funds. <laughs> mm. Which Ellen, is a bizarre system. A bizarre system. So I'm going to put the slut show 
and the specific birth control episode in the show notes. Is there anything else you want to plug? Follow us on Instagram at the Slut Show with Ellen Moore. We also have a backup account, which is the Slut Show with a zero instead of an O. Uh, we are not actually currently posting. Depends on when you're listening to this. I don't know when exactly it's coming out. Uh, we were having a little break because of my health issues, um, because of having to do my own self-efficacy. But I hope we're going to be back soon. So I hope that by the time you listen to this, we are back up and running. And in the case that our podcast name has changed, it will also be in your show notes, I guess. Yeah. It will. Uh, and everyone, you know, it's Instagram at men. I've tolerated pod. You're going to want to check out the Patreon because I'm putting free content up on the Patreon now to draw people to it. And that's the only place where you can find the misogyny meltdown. The only show where you can find people making jokes about the misogynistic patriarchal society that we live in. And that's the entire theme of the show. <laughs> Whoa, like, and we love it. We love it. Uh, and remember out there, tolerators, you don't have to smile through anything you're tolerating, including feeling so confused when you leave the doctor's office that you don't actually understand what medicine you're putting into your body. Yes, Queen, tell him. <laughs> Smiles are for joy. Joy.